I think deep down, if even if you don't have good parents, but especially if you good you have good parents, you just want them to be proud of you, right? You want to make them proud. The older you get, I think the more you appreciate what your parents did for you. We can endure anything and adapt and pivot and change. Wrestling gave us that ability. I would say nothing in life has impacted me more than the things wrestling has taught me in terms of self-reflection, resilience. Toughness. Some guys have it, some guys don't. Adversity, 100%. How to pick myself up and be a man after I failed. And everything that has shaped my life and where I'm at today would not be there without the values and basically the the lessons I've learned through the sport of wrestling. For me, wrestling saved my life because it, it allowed me to focus and channel my energy. We're fortunate if you wrestled because if you wrestled, natural talent helps, but it's, it's 5% of the ingredient. It pales in comparison to heart and technique and effort. It humbled me, taught me humility. Nothing can hit, humble you more than wrestling. I think it's the learning to adapt, right? You learn, you learn how to adapt, you learn how to solve problems. You know, if I look back at my time I spent wrestling, if it gave me one thing more than anything else, it's mental toughness. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the Wrestling Changed My Life podcast presented by Spartan Combat. This is your host, Ryan Warner. Our guest today is David Maricatani. David hosts two podcasts for USA Wrestling. He's a member of the Junior College Hall of Fame where he wrestled and coached at St. Louis Merrimack for over 15 years. Really enjoyed this conversation with David. Check out his podcast on USA Wrestling. And before we get to this episode, let's give it up for our Fan of the Week. A couple recent Apple Podcast reviews. Love seeing the Apple Podcast reviews. This week we have two new reviews. The first is from RJ Will one five-star review. I love to hear all the wrestling history from this podcast. And our second Apple podcast review is Lilo T. Five-star review. Great podcast. Thank you very much, RJ and Lilo, for letting us know how much you enjoy the show. Anyone listening who hasn't left an Apple podcast review, get out the phone, go to Apple, give us a review and a rating. It helps bubble up this podcast to wrestling fans just like you. This episode is brought to you by Beat the Street Chicago. I want to thank a listener of this podcast. This individual is a listener of this podcast and heard the call to support Beat the Street Chicago and gave a $1,500 donation. So thank you very much. Beat the Street Chicago is a first-class organization. They just released their impact report for 2022, which you can read on btschicago.org. Here are a few high-level stats. In 2022, they worked with over 2,500 wrestlers. Those wrestlers logged over 450 hours of after-school homework help, and 91% of them reported having more self-confidence. 86% felt more accountable for themselves. So this is an organization that's out there in the trenches doing real work every day, and our goal is for every Chicagoan, Chicago youth, I should say, to say that wrestling changed their life. So if you feel impacted by wrestling and want to support an organization that's doing the Lord's work, Go to btschicago.org slash donate. That's btschicago.org slash donate. This episode is also brought to you by Quant Wrestling. Quant takes the money ball approach to college wrestling. They track and timestamp hundreds of activities in a college wrestling match, input that data into their cloud analytics platform, and on their app, which you can download in the Apple and Google Play stores, You can see detailed statistics on college wrestlers. You can compare different wrestlers. So go to Quant Wrestling on the Apple and Google Play stores. Quant Wrestling, download the app now. And that's it, folks. Let's give it up for David Maricatani. David Maricatani, welcome to the podcast. Long time fan, long overdue. We we are long distance admirers of each other, I think is a fair statement, right? Yes, sir. Long time fan of your work and that interview you did with John Smith that I don't know how it ended up on YouTube or how I found it, but I've watched that probably 10 times before I even did my own podcast and then uh, watched it. And then after I started to know a little bit about wrestling media, I'm like, oh, that's David on the other end. So that was a that was a fun one. I've listened to it a bunch. 
Yeah, that was uh there's a couple sort of benchmark things and in terms of interviews, uh my family's very good friends with Coach Smith. My mom and dad stay at his with his family every summer. My dad goes fishing with John. And so uh we've known them a long time. And uh he didn't want to do the interview. So I had my mom call him. So he did the interview. So that's that's probably a little known thing behind uh behind that story, but he was great. And, you know, I think you do a lot of long form interviews. There's a lot of trust, right? Like if, if, if the person being interviewed, like today, if I think you're trying to catch me, you're trying to do a gotcha thing, you don't get a real answer. Once people are comfortable, they generally give you more than you, you hope for. And the fact that we have a relationship is uh, it turned out really good. And, you know, led to like hall of fame duels. There's a bunch of everything in wrestling in my life kind of overlaps somehow. So it's, it's interesting. So how your father is a very interesting figure that I've come across in my research here, hall of famer, 35 year plus Juco coach, black yeah. belt karate, you know, just everything, you know, just a real master. And, uh, you know, tell me about like his wrestling, how he got into wrestling, how he has all these connections. Well, he never wrestled till college. So like he was all city in basketball, football, and track. And to go back, my dad's actually a red belt, which is an eighth degree black belt in karate, judo, and Japanese jujitsu. So like I always tell people curfew was pretty non-negotiable growing up. You know, like the curfew is 11, you just knock at 1058 and go, I'm here, don't go looking for me kind of thing. Uh, he got into wrestling at college because he was too small for the other sports and he went to central Missouri. It was central Missouri state at the time. Now it's UCM and then did his graduate work with Harold Nichols and Les Anderson at Iowa state. And that's really where he fell in love with the sport. That's when Gable was there and, and Chuck Jean and all those guys. And uh, Nick was like a, he always calls him Nick. Like Nick was like a second father to him. And uh, wow. Was, those are yeah. legends. Yeah. He's, my dad's a very, he is unbelievably smart about body movement, about leverage, about angles. Uh, we still do clinics like once a year and he's, his feet for a 79 year old man are just like stupid good. And, but it's because he looks at wrestling as a martial art. And I, it, that's very hard to explain to people. But I grew up looking at wrestling as a martial art. And so I think maybe the best way to say it, it's like a puzzle. Not like we well, just got to lift more weights and get in better shape. And, and obviously those things are important if you're not strong enough, if you're not mentally strong enough, if you don't have the right strategy. But very few times in my life that I've ever heard my dad say to me or anybody's coach, you just got to do it harder. It's like, no, there's, maybe you're like, he. I always joke, my dad could be looking across the room, you and me drilling, and uh, you're not going where I want you to go. And he just like, go move your hand up three inches and lean your head. And then you just fall over. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, I'm the kind of person I got to get in there. Once I feel it, I'm like, Hey, move your hand up three inches. And then I fall over. I'm a, I'm a fuel coach. I'm like, do it on me. Okay. The lever, the leverage isn't right. My dad's, he's just so, he's so high level. And if we get into it, I can tell you like a story about what he did to help me in the jujitsu world championships that are exact. It's, it's a perfect ex example of, of how smart he is. Yeah. Let's get into it. What happened? So the, the first year I did jujitsu worlds, I just been coaching. I had helped a couple of the guys who were starting jujitsu gyms and teaching them wrestling. Obviously there's a ton of overlap there. I think people are seeing that more and more now. Uh, and so they were like, Hey man, you should fight in the world championships. And I'm like, sure. That's a good idea. You know, like I, I was just doing it to stay busy. Like I didn't even know how they kept score or anything. I didn't even know how to tie my gi, you know? And, uh, you know, but I respect it. Like I grew up around it. I grew up around a martial arts family, the importance of respect, like taking your shoes off at the door, all those kind of things that I think I grew up a little bit differently than some people. And, so we're going through it and I look, you know, I go through the rules and I'm like, my dad goes, so if you take them down and you don't, you don't get your, your arm broke, you're going to win. Right. I go, yeah, probably. He goes, yeah. He goes, just get in shape. You'll be fine. So it's gi and gi is very different because what people don't understand about gi is like, like I, I'm, I'm 99% sure. I remember you're taller than me. So like, if you get a hold of my collar and you go straight arm, 
very difficult for me to get to you, where if you have a collar tie, there's a bunch of different passes to get through your sort of head hands defense. Mm -hmm. And so I was struggling with that. It was like the week before the tournament. And I went up there with this guy and I, you know, we're at the, in the room at Merrimack and I tell him that and he goes, he just does this, you know, kind of looks and he goes, inside reap, right side. And so I, I knew that. And so I do it like five, six times. And I'm like, how do I break the arm? And, you know, two or three different ways to break the arm. Not break his arm, but break the, the straight arm. We do it like six minutes. I go get on a treadmill. A week later, I'm in the finals of the Worlds. It's 0-0 zero, zero in the finals. I have an advantage. He has an advantage. We come out of this crazy corkscrew sc scramble. We land right here. Hit inside reap. Win 2-0. Wow. And, yeah. And this is like 100 years ago. And I was married at the time, and my wife filmed the match. And I was coming back. We were at Merrimack, and like I was coming back the next day. And then my friend had a bachelor party on Saturday that I was running. And so I come back, and my, we're not laying until like 9 o'clock at night. And this is where the old camera, we had to plug it into the TV and everything. And my dad goes, did your wife film the matches? I go, yeah. And he goes, well, are you going to watch them? I'm like, I don't know, maybe Sunday or Monday. You know, He goes, well, we could come over tonight. He wanted to see him. And then he saw that and goes, he, it was a very cool look on his face. He goes, you did what I told you. I was like, yeah, for sure. So, you know, that having that stuff uh, in your hip pocket, you know, like I always tell people, if I ended up being a screw up in life, it'd be my fault. Like I was given all the opportunities to be a good person and the networking, a lot of the stuff I'm doing now, I hope now it's on my own name, but with our last name, it opened some doors initially for sure. You know, so. And you said I, your I dad was someone who looked at wrestling as a martial art. How do you think most people look at wrestling? I, I want to say this respectfully. I think uh, most people look at wrestling the way it was taught to them. Maybe that's the best way to say it, right? Sure. Like if that's a good answer. Yeah. Because it's like, you're right, though. Because, I mean, when you say wrestling is a martial art, I think a lot of people be like, yeah, I could see that. But unless they know, like, the culture and tradition of some of the other martial arts, like jiu-jitsu, there's a little bit of difference. And wrestling seems a little bit more brutish in some ways. And you can really win by that. You, that's totally anti jujitsu. There, yeah. So first of all, the first time my dad sort of voiced it to me, like we were watching the UFC and back when I was like underground stuff and Randy Couture and I are really good friends. And I met Randy through my dad. So, you know, like, you know, he was, a, he was a dude and he's a wrestler. Like he's winning in, in the beginning. Like none of us know where these arm bars and triangles are coming from, but guys that could slam guys on the mat and, you know, get in essentially what we now know as half guard and beat the crap out of people was it, it validated our sport. And my dad goes, wrestling's the best martial art. And I never heard, I said, what do you mean? He goes, the wrestler, if he's losing the standing game, can get to the body and take him down. And if the wrestler is winning the striking game can prevent the other person from taking him or her down. Mm -hmm. So that, that was sort of an oversimplification of it, but you know, and then all the other stuff tied to that, like the overlap with wrestling and jujitsu is unbelievable. Like uh, mm -hmm. I'm sure you know who Michael Pixley is. He's training over at Pedagos. He's, he just got his purple belt. He's a blue belt world champion multiple times. He started a jujitsu with me, like in my house, my dad gave him his first gi, and that guy's like a sponge, mm -hmm. unbelievably smart. His, his wrestling IQ is like out of this world, but he also sees I mean, Michael's strong, but he's not like, you know, like ripped up. He's real smooth. And guys that are smooth really transition to jiu-jitsu well, and they look at it differently. Like there's certain school styles like, okay, we're going to pick ankles. We're going to go forward. And good coaches will, like if you're an ankle picker, I'm not going to make you just push everybody out of bounds. I might just make sure you're cognizant of, controlling center, not losing bad stalling calls. And if it's freestyle, not losing caution to ones or one now one, you know, those kind of things, but just taking what you do and making you better. And that's, I think that's probably the martial art philosophy. Like the other thing is jujitsu is this passive. It, the jujitsu is designed for a smaller person to not get beat up by a bigger person. Like jujitsu, they have these absolute weight classes. So like, you know, you win your division. I win my division. We fight each other. Nobody thinks that Spencer Lee could be Gable Stevenson, like heads up. Right. You know, like 
And Spencer Lee is freaking awesome, but nobody thinks that because our sport relies a lot on strength and power, Mm -hmm. where jiu-jitsu, clearly not so much so. So it's fascinating, and people that are really good at jiu-jitsu are really good in weird scrambles in wrestling, like the new scrambles that are happening now. The jiu-jitsu men and women have a way better feel for it. So it's it's cool. It is cool, and it's helped. I don't know if it's helped popularize wrestling, but watching jiu-jitsu get so popular is exciting because it started from nothing in the 90s, and now it's there's a lot of practitioners, and it's growing like crazy, and it's a lot of fun for ex-wrestlers to get involved with. Tell there's, me about – go ahead. No, there's a brotherhood or a familyhood there that's similar. Like, you know, I think we all miss – like I, I don't miss a lot of aspects of coaching. A lot of it's a pain in the rear end, especially in junior college. Like every night you don't get a call at 11 o'clock is a freaking win. You know, like nobody's in trouble. But I miss the camaraderie, like the bus rides, helping people achieve their goals. And I, I coach a couple guys in jiu-jitsu, and I was fortunate enough to go to the Pans and the Worlds this year. Both those guys medaled at those. I got to watch Michael. You know, we went out and celebrated after he won. And, you know, he's a, he's a real kid. Like he gives credit where credit is due. And, you know, like I, I pointed him to a gym pedagogues, which is a perfect fit for him. He's grown by leaps and bounds and he does an amazing job there, but yeah. And jujitsu is great too. Like, as you get older, like Matt returns are not nearly as fun. That's actually illegal. In jiu-jitsu, so, you know, oh, it is. And you can, yeah, you can't slam people. Wow. Like, <laughs> so. So tell me about growing up. Both of your parents are 100% Japanese. I love hearing about... No, this your my father? mom's white. This your father? My mom okay. is white. My mom's German, Irish, French. Tell me about the... Just like the cultural differences. Because yeah, I love learning about cultures and like maybe how your father's approach to coaching wrestling was 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 different than uh, maybe an American approach. Well, yeah, I... So it's funny, like you only know what you know, right? Like you only know what you were taught. And so you don't know like how everybody else was taught. Like I didn't even wrestle. I wrestled one tournament in the fourth grade. I'll tell you this and then go back to the bigger sure. picture. I wrestled. I like, I want to wrestle. I wrestled in this tournament, practiced for like two weeks, got my tail kicked. I, I, I don't know if I'm still an ugly crier, but I was a very ugly nine-year-old crier. And I'm a, <laughs> and my dad goes, stop. And my dad loves us. Like he's an awesome father, but he's also very no nonsense. And he goes, stop. And, I, and and he goes, stop. He goes, look, you didn't deserve to win. You didn't train. He goes, you know, it, and it's embarrassing. He said, I love you, son. He goes, whatever you do, I support, but I don't support doing stuff halfway. So he goes, just decide if you want to be good, I'll help you get good. If you don't want to be good, let's not do this again. <laughs> no, but it, it was like the best. Yeah, it, it was loving. It wasn't like there was no name calling. His voice wasn't raised. It was like really amazing parenting when you think about it. Right. Like, let's just get to it, man. Like, what are you here for? Right. Like, you know, like you go buy a thousand dollars worth of equipment that doesn't make you a successful podcaster. That just means you had a thousand dollars of discretionary income. All the work you do and everything else is what the people you get, the questions you ask, what make you great. And then other people have to decide you're great because this isn't a win loss thing. Mm hmm. So I quit. I quit for three years. And I will say this. My dad didn't treat me any different. I just said to him, I don't want to do it. He goes, that's fine. I played soccer. I played every other sport. My dad was very interesting. Like, he was a great head coach, like, but he's probably better as an assistant coach because he's so technical. Like He does not want to teach 40 people head hands defense. He wants to teach 40 people, one person, the thing that works when they get past your head, hands, defense, the one thing that works for your body. And he can just look at you and know, okay, Ryan, this will work for you and it wouldn't work for David. And at the end of the run at Merrimack, that's kind of what happened. Like we kind of, he's the head coach for sure. But like I taught a lot of the boring stuff and he would go around and work with the guys. And it was awesome because they're like, man, your dad is so smart because, you know, he hates recruiting. So I recruited all of them. And, you know, they're like, man, your dad's unbelievable. Like I kept moms calling me like, or dads are like, man, we didn't know your dad was so smart. I'm like, he's a genius. He's an absolute genius. Wow. But what he would do is he would just kind of watch us wrestle and go, you're doing, that's not working for you. Try it this way. So it's probably the best way to coach like two people at a time, me and my brother. 
it's not the best way to coach 200 people at the time. Like, like Nick Perler couldn't do that. Like, you know, like Jody Stripmatter couldn't do that. And these, you know, like the, the guys up at Pinnacle, you can't do that. Like you got to teach it, get everybody pretty good at it and then do one-on-ones. Mm -hmm. What people don't understand is the guys that are really good one-on-one -on -one coaches, that's a different skill set than the guys that are good with 200 and they're not better or more important, but it's different. Sure. It's very different. And he's great at both, but he's unbelievably good. Like if he knew what he knew about podcasting, what he knew about wrestling, he could watch you for 15 minutes and probably tell you, you know, for me, for sure, you could tell me five things you're doing. I could be doing better. And the crazy thing is my mom's a communications teacher. So that's what's helped me with the pot. Like she's the Ron Maricatani of communication. So it's, you know, like. I love that analogy. Yeah. Well, she went with me to Hall of Fame duels and she was like watching and listening and she sat in on a couple business meetings. It was very, very cool because uh, my dad's got three black belts. And my mom's the toughest person in my family. That, that probably tells you everything you need to know. And I don't say that like metaphorically, like she's a savage. She's so an absolute funny. mental savage. Yeah. My When we went to the Iowa, Iowa State duel, my mom rode with me and we did a little a pregame show with stalemates and she just came in the hotel room and sat with us and, and Corby and a bunch of guys and she was just hanging out, loving it. So it sounds familiar. Yeah, I think deep down, if even if you don't have good parents, but especially if you good you have good parents, you just want them to be proud of you, right? You want to make them proud. The older you get, I think the more you appreciate what your parents did for you, like all of us, but the metaphorical you, like, man, these people, my parents never took a vacation. Their vacation was going to wrestling tournaments. So like, man, they, they let this happen. Like when I started the podcast, like the, we did two, we do two, but like the weighing in one, we're just talking about what's going on. My, my dad watched, he's like, man, it's really good. I go, dad, it's just you and me watching the finals of a tournament. It's right. just, we just recorded it. That's it. Like you're the one that taught me how to be smart. You and taught me how to break things down. You're the one that taught me how to ask people good questions, hopefully, you know, and those kind of things. So it's, uh, it, it's very, it was very cool. You know, like my mom, she knows certain kids. So she's like, which match should I be watching? Like, you know, she wanted to watch Sam Smith wrestle every round, you know, stuff like that. So, you know, we know Ethan Kyle, he, we coached Ethan's older brother. So there's, you know, and then like Andy Schneider, I mean, then all over, you know, she knows the names from all over the country, the people that I told her about as we were putting the tournament together. So I introduced her to a bunch of the coaches. It was just very cool. So it's, it, it's wanna... a moment I won't forget for a while. Yeah. No, and it's cool that that it's a it's a family deal for you guys, and that's a lot of wrestling families. I want to yeah. talk about the the Hall of Fame duels, but for folks who haven't listened to your podcast, could you give us the rundown on your wrestling career, kind of from seventh grade on, like when you got serious about it? Yeah, so I was a three time state champ, um, cadets. I was a four time All American. You know, twice for Greco, twice freestyle. I won. Greco one year and got O-dub. Uh, I dislocated my elbow my junior year, so I didn't wrestle any of that summer. And then my senior year, I just went to Iowa State. Uh, didn't work out there. I came back, wrestled for my dad, was a two-time All-American Junior College. I was, I think they, it's U-20s now. It was, it was called S-Bars or, you know, whatever the French name was. I was a four-time uh, All-American at that. And, uh, I mean, I, I beat some good guys. Probably the yeah. best win I had in my life was Dan Henderson when we were both like 15 years old and uh, you know, and then I won three jujitsu world titles, one second, one third, and uh, coached a bunch of guys better than me for sure. Um, you know, that's the goal, right? So, you know, had a bunch of kids and they coached a bunch of guys that have fought in the UFC and Bellator and all that different stuff. And, and that's, it's, you know, but I think as you get older, you're proud of all the athletes you've coached and I'll say guys, cause there weren't, there wasn't girls coaching back then, but you're proud of all your guys that are just making good decisions in life. You know, and probably once a year I get a call. I got a call when I was at the beat the street, Chicago gal, I'm getting dressed and the phone rings. And I, I save everybody's number. If for no other reason, if I don't want to talk to you, then I know it's you. And we all have those names. Right. And it was a kid I hadn't talked to in 10 years and he calls me and he goes, coach. I go, what's up, man. I'm not going to say his name, but he goes, coach, I owe you an apology. I said, I don't think so. He goes, no, I got to get this out. I said, okay. And he tells me about how he was coaching some kid and some kid stepped up to him and like was going to fight him. 
And this kid had done the same thing to me. And this kid was like 175 pounds and chiseled and everything else. And he goes, I remember you just walked away, never brought it up again, never held it against me. And he goes, I told this young man, you have God's grace today because I'm not going to fight you. And it would have been bad for you. But my coach did this. So I'm going to walk away. And I was like almost in tears because you, you don't. Re- yeah. Wow. That's yeah, insane. It was very, yeah. It's very cool. Right. Like, you don't. I think what the lesson to me is you don't know when you're making an impression on people. Right. Like you and me watched each other do whatever we've done for how long. And, you know, like whether it was the John Smith interview or like uh, Mark Ostrander told me that he was on your show on the twisters. Right. And, you know, Mark called me. He's like, well, is this okay? I'm like, yeah, that guy's awesome. You know, but like at some point you, you just don't know when people are watching Mm -hmm. and you don't know when it's making a difference. And the thing is, I never brought it up to that kid and it happened in practice. And my dad said, are you going to say anything to him? I go, no. He goes, why? I go, I don't know. I think he's having a bad day. Like I think something's going on at home and I'll find out. And it was, I don't remember what it was now. It's, It's irrelevant. What's relevant is how'd you handle it right like i mean you can do anything from kicking the kid off the team to yelling at him to make him work out to, or just being his friend and listen there's been there's a, probably a hundred coaching stories where i didn't make the right decision so i'm not you know i'm trying to say i bad at a thousand or anything like that but it was very cool it was a very cool moment and then you know i think you and i are in the same boat in this and that the long form interviews I, I have this term and I'm sure other people use it, but I call it intellectual generosity where people share with you the real stuff, like how they got good at things, how they learn, how they're improving, how they look at the world, just the little thing that makes them different, that makes them special. And so I feel like if I'm not getting smarter as a human being, because a lot of this stuff is overlap, right? Like what makes you good at your job, what you're doing here? It's probably the same thing that would make somebody a better father, a better husband, a better mother, a better brother, a better sister, a better coach, a better friend, a better whatever. Like, interesting. Maybe it's not a hundred percent applicable, but better is better. Improvement is improvement, right? And so there's like once a year, somebody will call me and just say, "Well, I'm probably more than that." They'll go, "Hey, man, I'm sorry, I was a jackass back in college," and I'm like, "Well, nobody wants to be judged on their worst day when they were 19 years old." Like, That's we're cool. So true. Yeah, it, like when, and like you it, said though, when no one's watching is the key part because I think you're exactly right. We can all think of stories where a coach had an impact, and I don't know if they would remember it at all or remember it that way. You know, yeah, that's yeah, that's powerful. And and you were a coach for you know multiple sports and for a long time. When you yeah. think back to your dad coaching you, like what was your kind of regiment in high school that allowed you to get so good? I mean, three time state champ, two time O Dub. Were you guys doing? And the reason I'm asking about your routine is because we've all heard Zach Sanders come on and say he's riding the Aerodyne every morning at five and he's busting his ass. And that's amazing. Were you doing something similar or were you guys no. doing a different approach? No, um, I actually had three different high school coaches in four years. So there was not a lot of continuity. Oh, wow. Uh, so I think I'm probably the only guy in the history of Missouri that has won three state titles with three different guys in his corner. Um, but they listen shout out to those guys shout out especially to jerry warren who's greg warren's dad if you know him the comedian love he, greg he I, warren we were on the same team together we won he, greg won it when out he was a junior and i was a freshman and when he was a senior and a sophomore we won state together which is very cool so his dad so he has a hilarious joke about his dad being a high school wrestling coach and like that's him that's so him. he was your coach wow and the jokes are not jokes they're just stories that are funny <laughs> They're not jokes. It's true. Uh, yeah, no, they're all true. Yeah. I mean, Greg's a great storyteller, but he's I mean, amazing. Yeah, he's awesome. And then my senior year, I had Shepard Pittman, who had actually wrestled at Forest Park, which was my dad's big rival, but he was a division one All-American in Missouri. Uh, but my dad was really my coach. Right. And so mm-hmm. back then, like when I went to the equivalent of Fargo, there was no team. We just went with my mom and dad and brother. Like the years I, I won it, like there was no team Missouri. Um, I think what we did probably different than anybody else was, especially if we had short practices, I would drive, it's illegal now, I'm sure, but like I would just drive straight from the high school and go practice with the college guys. Hmm. And my dad let me start wrestling with the college guys when I was in seventh grade and he gave me a piece of advice. I didn't understand it for about seven years. He goes, right before I walk out there, he grabs my arm. He goes, hey, 
If you win, shut up. If you lose, shut up. I didn't know what it meant. I mean, I just knew to be quiet. I mean, I knew that much. I got good. But what I realized later was, hey, these guys have no, there's no benefit to them to wrestling with you. You know, like you're 12. So they're not getting anything out of it, realistically. So if you win, be humble. And if you lose, don't complain because they're not, they're going to come to my dad and go, we don't want to work out with your kid. He's a baby. And, you know, just like, okay, John Smith has come on your show. John Smith has come on my show, right? Like John Smith did us a favor. Right. Mm -hmm. But there's other people that like if you go on their show or you promote them, you're doing them a favor. And so it's very good to be humble. Sometimes you're the bug. Sometimes you're the windshield. Don't don't get all windshieldy too much because that worm can turn quickly. Mm -hmm. So but yeah, so we th basically I love that philosophy, the other thing was though, the the if you win, shut up, if you lose, shut up. I bet your dad had so many one liners like that, that it didn't take a lot of words, but it had a lot of impact. He's EF Hutton for sure. For people that are old enough to know that. But to answer your question, like our philosophy was, I think it was just skill, technique, skill, technique. Like he expected you to be in shape. Like he, you know, like we would wrestle live enough, you know, the teams we coached and me and my brother to get good. But it's like, look, like you don't need me to teach how to run. Go run. If you need to run, run. If you need to lift, I'll tell you what to lift, but go lift. Like what I can teach you that nobody else can teach you is, is, a, is a coach, is skill, technique, and what works for you. Mm. And again, I think he does not deal with uh, non-self-motivated people very well at all. Like for years, my dad would make his college weight. Like up till he was about 65 years old, he would cut to 123 every year. Wait, just and to he, prove a point? Just to remember what it was like to suffer. Whoa, what? That is dedication. Well, and he probably only weighs like 135 now. But I, I read a lot of these. I'm trying to study more, but the the there's this whole thing going out now. You probably see it like, hey, strong men lead to, you know, good times. Good times lead to soft men. Soft men lead to bad times. Bad times lead to strong men. It's this circle, right? Suffering's really important, right? Like I always tell people this. I'm like, listen, without cheaters, you wouldn't appreciate loyal people. Without ugly people, you wouldn't appreciate beautiful people. Without dumb people, you wouldn't appreciate smart people. Uh, without selfish people, you wouldn't appreciate generous people. And so, like, like if you have a relationship and somebody cheats on you, like, I mean, if you're if any of your friends, like, man, I wish that didn't happen to it. But honestly, when you meet the next person and they're super loyal, you appreciate them a lot more. True. You know what it feels like. You know what it feels like to be lied to, to be made a fool of, any of those things. So, um. My dad didn't put it in those terms, but like he would just, I always say, like, Dad, why are you making weight? Like, that's crazy. You know, like you said, like that was my, he's like, I need to remember what you're going through. I'm like, okay, man, let's go hit this treadmill. Wow. Like, I remember what we used to do a lot was we used to run around the swimming pool at Merrimack because swimming pools are always really warm, you know? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And we used to run around and we had this old little stereo, like, you know, maybe a cassette player <laughs> and that's all and he would my dad runs like a freaking gazelle and he would just be like just chase me and we would all chase him around for like a half an hour and nobody could catch him holy so, your dad's a real deal man yeah he's yeah uh, he's that dude for real now yeah. when you were in juco was the great steve williams wrestling juco at this time i coach against steve okay so he so but he because he he wrestled in the later 90s but then in the early years i think he came through there too it was um so yeah he was there twice okay got it he was there once for iowa central and once with kennedy king and uh he might have been the best of the williams brothers like i'm friends with tj i, I talked to joe at world cup but he was just their stories like okay so i think we have a mutual friend in lee pritz oh yeah yeah so Next time you see Pritz, ask him about when Steve Williams showed up for practice at Garden City. Just ask him that story. I won't. Okay, I will. I just just I like put a note and ask him and then text me later and be like, that was freaking awesome. Uh, but yeah, like I lost in the finals to Frank Velasquez five to four, and he ended up being a division one All-American in Nebraska the next year. Yeah. So. And, and the reason I ask is that I, I was looking here at 91, your first year, you, you take seventh, 92, you take second. 
That yeah. is the beginning of the golden era for Juco wrestling. And maybe it started before. I just know that 90s era was freaking ridiculous. Tony Davis, TJ Williams, DC, Munoz. I mean, all those guys, hammers yeah. for Juco. Well, TJ Williams is a trivia question. You know, he didn't win Juco's, right? Right, right. Which is like crazy. He only had one loss at Iowa and uh, yeah. to the he late like great. 89 and one and won two NCAA titles. And didn't win JUCOs. And the real answer is who knows? I know. Do you know who beat him? In I JUCOs? Don't. No. A guy named Glenn Garrison, who is a Greco guy out of Clackamas. That's right. Okay. The only reason but, I say I mean, that's you right. Mentioned you those, you yeah, mentioned those hammers like Matt Linwin was a JUCO guy. Rulon Gardner was a JUCO guy. Uh, Matt Hughes was a JUCO guy. Brock like Lesnar? A, yeah. Oh, Cornell Robinson, who's the coach at Wyoming Sam. OK, he mm -hmm. wrestled for us in Merrimack. That's who he lost to in the blood round. His freshmen, they were both freshmen. Wow. Yeah, he so lost was... to him. He lost to him at the weigh ins because he just got intimidated and then came <laughs> back and just couldn't run him down in time. Like we had a guy that Jamil Kelly was in Juco, didn't mm -hmm. win it. Silver medalist of the Olympics didn't win Juco. I know it's crazy. I mean, yeah. there's just so and. It just from that era happened to be a lot of Chicago guys like Reggie Wright. And you know, so there was just a fun era to kind of follow when I, I was like in middle school in the mid two thousands, Oh, two Oh three, I guess. But those guys were fresh. And uh, only later in life did I come to realize, Oh, they all went Juco. And then basically all of them went on D one. And there's just so many hammers from that era. I'm sure there's still yeah. a lot coming through, but definitely during that time. We have to remember this, that it was way harder to get into D one then. I don't mean that rudely, but like, the academic standards and everything like look, you look now like in all these sports kids are just getting passed they're mm -hmm. getting put through and with covid like now your act and sat scores don't matter so a bunch of these guys like nobody thought like i coached deron win deron win was not a junior college talent guy he was just a junior college academic guy same thing with dc right like right they, that's most nobody of the case. Thought, right but now those guys are getting into d1 got it got it and there's also this rule now where you can sort of hardship a kid where like they can they didn't they didn't qualify, but they get to go anyway. And if they graduate in four years, even if they redshirt, then they get they have to redshirt their first year. Then if they go four years and graduate on time, they get their year back. Wow. So there's it's funny because I was with um, the Iowa Central guys when I was doing a documentary on Tony Davis and I was kind of asking, I'm like, what's you know, how come we don't see the pipeline that we used to and what's what's going on? And they said a lot of it has to do with D2 and D, D3 particular and NAIA. That's gotten a lot bigger. And NAIA giving scholarships, you know, people don't, you know, people a lot of times will just go there. Um, but I think in general, though, I didn't really think about the angle of D1 being a little bit easier to get into, which is a... Uh, I would respectfully, and I, I like Luke Moffat a lot, but I would respectfully disagree I think the best the kids that want to be the best want to wrestle division one. And if you mm -hmm. can't wrestle division one, they would probably go Juco. Josh Roden would tell you that he was, he built something special at Clackamas before he moved on. Yeah. Is I he think the guys, he, he's at Oregon state with, with Nate and Chris, and they just had a, a great meet out there. Like seven that we just talked yeah. about 7,000 people for that duel on Sunday. But I think that those kids, I like if you go D2, D3 or any, I, these other coaches are not allowed to recruit you. It doesn't mean they're not doing it. I mean, everybody's doing illegal stuff now and you go on the portal and the next day you're somehow at a new school. I'm mean, like, you know, like I broke up and the next day I have a new girlfriend. Like I was probably talking to her before then, you know, <laughs> right, but, right. But to do it cleanly, you're, you're not supposed to go to another four year school. Four years are not allowed to recruit other four year kids. Like okay. that's actually a rule. Okay. So like, if you go to Juco, like if I'm coaching you and you go beat Daniel Cormier, John Smith's walking over to the corner before the match is over. Like, who the hell's this Warner kid? <laughs> right. No, I mean, that's that's how it used yeah. to work. Yeah. That, yeah. So the other interesting thing is this, that maybe the rules have changed, but in JUCO, you can't transfer in at the semester and be eligible. Okay. But in D1, you can. So every year we'd have some coach trying to just pick a kid off of our team in December. Like someone who crushes at the St. Louis Open and they beat a yes. D1 guy. Yes. You know, yes. that's yeah. 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 That's a, 
Well, I, I honestly feel like that a little bit now with the transfer portal where for a lot of the mid-major programs, they spit out a good guy, you know, and he's there maybe his sophomore year and then he's gone. And it's like, yeah. oh, you feel so bad for the coaches because they, they found him, made him the diamond in the rough. Now he's an All-American, which is like a freaking staple for that program. And then he leaves and it's like, oh, what are you going to do? It's like so tough, so frustrating. Well, I was on the floor at NCA's last year and uh, – <laughs> Nate Engel told me, he goes, you would not believe the number of kids, call, number of coaches having people back channel our kids right now during the tournament about leaving. It's that blatant. Yeah. But it's like, okay, like I'll, I'll pick me. So like it's Maricatani University and you're a friend of the program. Like you call the person. Of course. And go, hey, hey. I think Maricotani University could use you next year and they probably have some scholarship or NIL money. Like, is that something you're interested in? The kid goes, no, I'm happy where I'm at. Okay, well, no harm, no foul, theoretically, right? They are. Now the conversation starts. And so yeah. trainer and I have this conversation all the time about, because he's old school and I love Mark. Like, you know, Mark's like cool older brother I didn't have. But he's like, this is all new. I'm like, no, this is like, like NIL money is just like back OU football in the eighties where they're paying somebody $300 an hour to turn the lights on and off in the swimming pool. Like it's just out now. Yeah. You know, if yeah, you I watch mean, that documentary pony express, it's a 30 for 30. Yes. Yeah. So good. Just like that, you know, but now it's happening yeah. on the up and up. Same thing supposedly. with USC with like Reggie Bush and liner and all those guys. Right. And yeah. the other thing that people are super myopic about in wrestling is no one cares about wrestling. The NCAA doesn't care. This is all to keep. This is basically to keep basketball from doing what football did and keeping all the end of the season money. This is all designed for that. Because if the NCAA basketball took the money from the NCAA basketball tournament, the NCAA would be out of business. Like How people do don't think. Sorry. How do you mean? So like it, there's that. There's a seven year, one billion dollar contract with CBS, and TBS and TNT, all that stuff for the NCAA basketball tournament. Okay, that's why they have three hundred vice presidents and nobody knows what the hell they're doing. Okay, <laughs> okay. I mean, I'm just like I'm yeah. a business guy. Okay, like I'm a, the events I run, and you know I don't know how much time we have left, but I'm a business guy. If you took one billion dollars out of it, there's only two or three sports that make money for the NCAA. Mm -hmm. and football like we watched that travesty of a national championship game but the money of that game does not go to the ncaa it goes to those two teams and their conferences right so the ncaa does not get a cut of the pie the ncaa gets the whole pie in basketball i see what you're saying now give it up okay so that's all how the rules different. are designed around that got that's it. it got it got it that the i NCAA, never thought about we, it like that the NCA is like the parents that ground you, but don't feed you or house you. Exactly. They're like, why am I listening to you? Like, if you think about it, like, why are we listening to you? Like, you guys don't actually do anything. Like, you're working, and then your terrible parents take your money and then tell you what to do. Mm -hmm. I mean, it shouldn't be that way, but that's what it is. Yeah. No, it's a... Uh... I wonder if, like, I don't know if NCA provides money to the college programs. Probably not, right? There's no funding going from the NCA to college wrestling programs. Like there is like the USOEC to USA Wrestling. I can't say that for sure, but it's highly doubtful. Right. I mean, like, I know how the bidding process works for the nationals. And if we have another hour at some point, I could walk you through that. <laughs> like I know firsthand, I've talked to two sports commissioners and they walk through exactly how it works. It's fascinating. Yeah. That's the cool thing about some of the stuff I'm doing. Like you get to hear the real things. and. You know, it's interesting, like, I think you and I are alike in the sense, like, we don't have to be first. Like, there's certain people in the media that have to say they knew first. There's stuff I know all the time, and I just don't tell people because I'd actually like to stay friends with those people. Yeah, that's not my, uh, I'm not a news organization. I'm a convert, I'd say just a storytelling organization. I'm with you, though. Like, the breaking the news first. And I think I'm glad that people out there do that because I do like following wrestling news. And sure. it, but yeah, it's not my, not my angle. Um, I don't watch enough college wrestling to be on that. I watch a couple duels a week, but there are some people I'm so impressed by how much they know about college wrestling. And then high school is a whole nother level where I don't yeah. watch high school wrestling except for Fargo, you know, not well, because Mark I don't I, like it. I love it, yeah. but Mark and I did the that. rankings for 
we watched, we did the track wrestling rankings for five years. We were the first people to rank 25 people because 25 people score points. We were the first people to rank 33. Nobody gives us credit for that, but we were the first ones to do it. And trust me, ranking 26 through 33 is way harder than one through 12. Like some of these, some of these people now just put honorable mention, like they just throw them in there and they don't sort them out. And, and I see that because they're all going on to at nationals theoretically, mm -hmm. but we followed every single result. We would get the email from Seton Hall Pirate that had every single result. We'd go through so every single one, pull out all the upsets, and then every Sunday night, that's what we would do. Wow, that's so much work to do rankings, and it's a thankless job because you're only getting called if someone disagrees with it a lot of times. <laughs> Normally, but here's what I'll tell you. There's probably seven to ten coaches every year that would call me when the coaches' rankings were due. And they would be like, how'd you figure this out? What'd you do? So what we've done now on our podcast is uh, the guys at fantasygrade.com, they put together the cons all the rankings from all the sources on one website and it's free. So like when these coaches will start calling me now, I'll send them that site and I'll say, here's why I think Warner's rankings are right. Americatani's rankings are wrong, but it's all one spot. What is the coach's ranking impact? Anything or is it just for to have it's it? eating of nationals. Oh, it is. It's That's twenty percent of the. Okay, it's only twenty percent though. Yeah, but it should like, be that's a whole other conversation. Like I know for sure that coaches trade votes. Oh, hundred and like I don't, I don't blame a coach for not being able to seed and rank guys that, you know, outside of their guys. How are they going to know like the the twenty through thirty? So it's kind of weird that you would even they put shouldn't. that on coaches. Yeah, I don't think well, they especially should. like let's say you have a terrible one twenty five pounder. Like you know, you just know you're bad at that way. Okay. Who the hell is the 32nd best 125 pounder in the country? Like, why are you paying attention to that? You should be working on getting your 133 pound better and getting Absolutely. a better 125 next year. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So they college coach. I never really thought about that they're ranking. I, you know, it's just there's a lot that goes into being a college coach. I know you know that. And it's a it's a very long job, always working weekends, taking recruiting calls. So there's a lot yeah. on their plate already. And when you mentioned the NIL, that's a whole other funding source they have to track down now. So it's it's a really brutal job. Do you think? Um, I know everyone and their brother, including me, has talked about this. Uh, you know, changes to college wrestling. Do you think the medical forfeit thing is where it needs to be right now, or do you have some ideas on how we could fix this? Yeah, we talked about it on the pod. I think the two things are like people don't understand is medical forfeits and national duels, right? Like those are the two things that are kind of the big subject right now. So medical forfeit, let's just say it this way. People are going to coach to the rules. So if you want this to change, you need to change the rules, right? Like our season, and I made this comparison, our season is like college basketball. Nothing matters, but the conference tournament and the national tournament. So, but seating points and all that stuff matters. So like if, if I know I'm handcuffed to you, okay, like I, I beat you, you beat me. Let's do it this way. You beat me. But then there's another guy that you think might beat you and we just don't wrestle, but I beat that other guy earlier. Now you're, you're one, I'm two, the other guy's three. Where if you lose to the three, now it's a circle and maybe the, the other guy's got criteria. Like if you look at college football and they're about to screw it up and add all these other teams because now the games become more and more meaningless, but they're doing it for money. So I get it. But every game matters. Like you lose two games, you're basically out. So it doesn't matter if your quarterback was out, your, your running back was out, whoever, your, your best defensive lineman was out. You have to play. If they want this to matter, they need to do it like, and I don't know much about auto racing, but like, the the NASCAR thing or like golf. I know golf a little bit, like all these tournaments, there's points and then it goes to the end and the, the win, person wins $10 million and it's a staggered start. You still have your majors. Mm -hmm. So you could work those in there. Like CKLV would have to be a major, right? Right. Okay. But they need to make it matter. Or like, this is the dumbest thing I think we do in wrestling. We decide our nationals on a tournament format that we don't ever use the entire year. What other tournament do we have a three-day weigh-in? Mm -hmm. Okay. And 60% of our events are the complete opposite, and the team scoring is opposite of the tournament. And you know this. You go to some tournament, I'll go, is first worth 16 or worth 10 or worth 12? Like, because it depends on the size of the tournament. People wonder why wrestling isn't growing. It's because it's freaking ridiculously hard to understand, like, the NFL playoffs are starting this weekend. 
in all the games, a touchdown will be worth six points. In all the games, they're going to play four 15-minute quarters. Like, mm -hmm. you got to make it – you have to create continuity. And there's also a really, a really big discussion on is the team winner at the individual tournament really the best team? Because we've seen many times where you'll have – Three real, I remember one year Arizona State, and I like I'm not knocking Arizona State. This back in the early 2000s the, or 2010s, they had like Robles, they had Bubba, and they had another guy, and they were like top ten, but they had a losing record in the dual season. So the other opposite side of that is Arizona State won the nationals way long ago without a national champion. 1988. Yes, that was my senior year. Uh, yeah, so I think it's your definition of team, right? So let's put it this way: let's say you have a team with five national champions. Okay. You're going to win nationals, right? Mm -hmm. You're all, let's say you only have five guys on the team. You're going to lose every duel. Cause even if you're, you guys have to pin and then it's a tie. Right. Okay. Right. It's a tie. So you might win. Cause it comes down to first points and they didn't score any points. So you'd win. Okay. You have to pin everybody. You're going to go winless, but you'd walk through nationals. So, this is my point when I always say that people ask this, I go, in tournaments, your best guys decide who wins it. In duels, your worst guys decide who, who win it. Like, we watched the Stillwater-Edmund North duel, which was freaking awesome, but it was a couple guys that weren't supposed to win that won, and there was another guy that was a freshman, only got made, or only got decisioned by Cale Hughes. And, like, if he gets teched, that duel's a tie, and I don't remember what the criteria was. Hardell and I were figuring it out on the air, but, like, it's different. If if Kale used pins that kid, they win the duel. How heated was that duel? Because <laughs> people hate Stillwater. Yeah, it, well, it's interesting for me because I was working with the Stillwater people, right? Like, I like you know, Stillwater people too, but in general, there's a consensus that these guys have gotten a little out of control on their move-ins. The the in the one that really flagged is an Illinois boy uh, who we love transferred January. That's bizarro to to Stillwater. Yeah, I mean, Braden Thompson, we just talked about on our pod. But again, first of all, it had nothing to do with what happened at Doc B. This was in the works for a long time. And again, like if he goes there and gets emancipated and now qualifies for full aid and gets the Oklahoma grant, people might be doing it for economic reasons. Like people True. don't understand all that. To go back to your question. Sorry, yeah, I don't know. That, no, 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 no. I'm just saying people don't know. Yeah. Like Austrian had the same position you did. And I actually I think you guys are right. It's just it's not incomplete data. But like. The duel was awesome. I mean, I'm I'm we're looking at it from a tournament director standpoint. When you're a tournament director, like when I run Missouri Border Brawl, like I don't care who wins. I hope nobody gets hurt and nobody gets cheated, right? Like that's all you care about. Like, okay, the referees did a good job. Nobody got injured and it was fair. But it was unbelievable because Hardell and I were calling it and like six matches out, I'm like, I got to get a pen and paper and figure out what happens if this is a tie. And they also knew like their heavyweight was way better and they were, they knew, Edmund North knew they were going to win at heavyweight, lose at 95 or whatever the weight class is because there's 37 weight classes in high school. And then at the 210, 215 weight, they knew Oscar Williams was going to win. So you kind of work backwards, you know, and and do that. But it was – I wouldn't say – it was heated, I'm sure, but it was awesome. Yeah. Like everybody there that did – let's put it this way. If you weren't rooting for Team A or Team B, you're like, that was awesome. And for our first year running it with the folks at the Hall of Fame – like blessing, right? Yeah. Blessing. No one got hurt. Everything started on time. Everything ended on time and unbelievable wrestling. And that Hall of Fame classic, it, it looked from the coaches feedback, just 10 out of 10 across the board with, with how it was run. Well, you thank you. Yeah. Um, that had a lot to do with Leroy Smith, Ed Gallegos, Jack Carnifix, Lindsey Hammer, Clay Hudson, uh, Ethan Kyle. He had to wear two hats that weekend. And so, you know, he he kind of put his team on the back burner and helped us with stuff. Uh, all my announcers, you know, all those guys were on the mic, you know, all, uh, Jeremy Rooks and Bill Gawkel for getting us on the air with flow. Like Sandy Stevens, A.L. Hazlip, when you have those people announcing, it sounds like a real event, right? Yeah. Like, I mean, like, you know, so I think a lot of the things that we could control, we did well, but then a bunch of the things that you can't control worked out. You know, and, and you have to, like I told every all the coaches, you're right. I go, boys, next year is probably going to be a mess because we got so blessed this year. Something bad's probably coming, so just bear with us, you know. I, 
I talked to Brian Stoll from Del Barton yesterday, and he just said, he goes, you started everything on time, ended it on time. He goes, everything else was a bonus. He goes, I give anybody good credit the first time they do it. It starts and ends on time. And the Hall of Fame gave all those kids a free tour of the hall, like their own private tour. The Hall of Fame has so much uh, just they could do, and I know they do a lot already, but like I love that they're doing this tournament. I think it'd be cool to even do like the induction ceremony around a tournament. I mean, you could bring everyone in, and yeah, there's just there's so much – and that, that Hall of Fame is really cool. I grew up going to the one in Iowa quite a bit, just uh, grow, you know, growing up in the area. But going down there and seeing what they've done with the Oklahoma one, it's amazing. First class experience. It is. And those people, it's interesting. You go from like, you just go from them being theoretical to them being real to being on a Zoom with them every week. Like I didn't get hired till May and that's a long story. We don't have time for it, but like, when they hired me, they go, what are you going to do? I go, well, I'm going to go get the rankings and just start calling from the top. Right. You know, and where Ethan was great was he got a bunch of the, uh, he got the Oklahoma schools and it was really good to share Oklahoma's good. So is he the head coach at Stillwater? Yeah. That's what I thought. And yeah. when I say they're the most hated team, all the good teams are the most hated Oak park. They hated them. I was city West in my era hated them. I, and I don't know anyone that actually does. I just know that. When you get a team that's bringing a lot of kids in from out of state, it's it raises some eyebrows. Not that anything wrong is going on, just that people are going to hate them naturally, especially if if it's a a, a local Oklahoma team and uh, they're battling. So, I'm sure it was a would have been awesome to be at that duel, to be a fly in the wall there, just because they're so passionate well, about wrestling. You want to come in next year? We'll VIP you, boss. I dude, I appreciate that. I want to. My I I have to get back to the Hall of Fame. I love it down there, and it would be good to see. Good to see a high school tournament in person just because it's there's so much energy. Uh if you go to a high school tournament and just the the fans and it's really exciting. Well, we have two more top ten teams committed for this next year and another top twenty five team. And we're working I think all sixteen teams will be ranked in the top forty next year. It's amazing. And that's on and the other of, thing, just go ahead. on that real quick, is there's certain states that can't come to us. California. So pe people need a well, no, California can. We had Poway, but what you can't, what is like, their thing? They can't go if there's a not if there's a prep school there. They can come. They can't wrestle. Them. So we can only have four combined California prep schools in the meet because we got to put them in separate pods. Okay. And like minute like Michigan can't travel, Iowa can't travel. It, it's non contiguous. Ohio can only leave non contiguous once a year. So I don't think New York can travel. Uh, I don't think Indiana can travel. So like if you start look and then like. California has like seven teams in the top 50. We're not taking more than two of them. So now we're down to 45, you know, like there's six prep schools. So now we're down to 41. There's uh four Michigan schools. We're down to 37. So people think, well, you have 50 schools to pick from. Like we have like 26 schools to pick from, and we're probably going to get 16 of them. Sure. But then people get mad. Like, well, why do you have three New Jersey schools? Like, well, because they were willing to come. They're really good. And there's a bunch of these other States that we can't have come in. Who would come? Who would complain about that? Like, that's a thoroughbred state. You know, like you want. Yeah, them, but you want it to theoretically, you want it to look as big as possible, right? Like this year, having a California school, having a Florida school and having a New Jersey school looks about as big as you can get it. Is it right? a dual like, tournament? Yeah, it is. OK, God, I thought it was just based on how you were saying the, the pods and the pools. It's um, four pools of four. You wrestle everybody round rob and that creates a gold, silver, bronze, copper pools or brackets, essentially. And then you wrestle semis and finals of those. So we wrestle all the way out to 16th place. Love it. I think dual tournaments are great. And it, I, high school, I didn't really know about that many of them growing up. So I think it's cool that more of them are coming together. We're over time here, so I have to sign off. But let me ask you one last thing, David. And we got to get you back on because there's so many things on my list here we didn't talk about, like the Missouri border brawl or or your yeah. financial planning business. You know, I'm in sales. So I love talking sales. Um but let's just sign off with this. I mean, you're you're ap absolutely super involved in wrestling, but you've had a unique perspective of it growing up with your dad. Like, what's one lesson you, you take away from from all those years wrestling and coaching with your pops? That's a great question. Uh, I don't know if it's a lesson. I, I truly value that time. The older I get, the more I look at it. And, you know, most people pay it forward in life and I got to sort of pay it backwards. You know, like my dad doesn't like to recruit, but he likes to coach when I was able to give him better, better clay to work with. It was probably one of the best gifts uh, I can, I could have given him. And uh, you know, the name of your podcast is wrestling changed my life. Like 
I only started wrestling because I got beat up when I was a kid because I was Japanese. And we never even got into that. But there's the whole story there. And I just, I came to my dad one day. I'm like, I'm tired of getting my ass kicked. And he taught me how to wrestle. Wow. So, you know, if you would be kind enough, if you think about having us on before the Oklahoma border brawl, because we're, we're running that? that in March, right before nationals, Tuesday, yeah. March 14th, then we could probably, there's probably enough stuff we could touch on for sure. So no, I would love to. And please tell Mark Ostrander, I say hello. I have uh, I had a really good time going out to his basement and chatting with him. And uh, he's, he's a great guy. Mark is the freaking man. And he actually just texted me. So I'll text him now. To let him know, man. Yeah, no, David, thank you so much, man. It's it's a long overdue, and we'll definitely have you back in March, and I'll see you at the NCAs, my friend. All right, man. Thank you. Appreciate you. All right, brother. Thanks for listening to this episode of Wrestling Changed My Life with David Maricatani. To support this podcast, please go to btschicago.org slash donate. Download the Quant Wrestling app now in the Apple and Google Play stores. And go to spartancombat.com to shop Yanni D. and Kyle Dake shoes. We'll see you next week with new episodes of Wrestling Changed My Life.